Welcome. Welcome to the last talk of our summer series. I'm Nancy Wilhelms. I'm the executive director of Anderson Ranch. And it's been an amazing summer, and there are a few people I would like to thank. First, I'd like to thank our sponsors, including our presenting sponsor, Toby Lewis, and our National Council sponsors. Also, I'd like to thank our corporate and media partners and all of our other supporters for today's presentation. Thank you all so much. I'd also like to thank our Art and Artist Advisory Group, which is led by Sue Hostetler, for their work in developing this very strong program. And there is a person, yes, let's give him a front. And there's a person who pulls all the speakers in logistics together who deserves a very special mention. She's our Deputy Director, Ashley Toddy. Ashley, thank you so much. Before we start, I would like you to know that we're going to have a free-ranging conversation, that you're invited to join in with a question during our conversation if you raise your hand, and we'll bring you a microphone. And please wait until you have the microphone in your hand before asking the question. And the reason why is because we have another whole audience, and it's outside, it's in the cafe, and they're watching the program on TV screens, and we want them to be able to hear the questions as well. Well, today's guests are the Haas brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Simon and Nikki. And they grew up together in Austin, Texas. They're twins, you know. And after high school, they each went different directions. Simon went to Rhode Island School of Design, and Nikki hit the road as a touring musician. The two joined together professionally and founded the Haas Brothers in 2010, just six short years ago. The Haas Brothers have worked with and for huge names such as Lady Gaga, Tobey Maguire, and Versace on custom furniture, garments, props, interiors, wallpapers, and rugs. They also launched a beaded collection of some very quirky creatures with an AIDS benefiting company called Monkey Biz, and in collaboration with a group of South African bead artisans that they fondly dubbed the Haas Sisters. <laughs> <laughs> the brothers are represented by R and Company, and I first met them at Design Miami two years ago. They invited me to visit their studio, and my husband Larry and I did so, and Toward the end of our tour of their studio, we visited the ceramics area, and they had a dinky kiln, okay? This tiny electric kiln. And I said, guys, we have 19 kilns at, elect at Anderson Ranch, including one that's like a refrigerator where you can open the door, right? And you've got to come. So last summer, they came on a reconnaissance visit, and then I got a phone call in the fall, whoops, and they asked if they could come back and, and work here for a month. And I said, of course, yes. And they were with us from mid-May until mid-June of this year, creating an entire body of work. And Nikki and Simon, let's talk a little bit about your experience here. I'd like to know about your time here, what you did, and how it will affect your practice in the future. And uh, I'd also like to share with everybody this beautiful work that came out of the kiln this morning. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is, this is uh, one of the pieces that we produced here. Uh, it's a piece like we haven't been able to make before. As Nancy was saying, our kiln setup is pretty uh, minimal in LA. And so when we got here, we were so excited to try to scale up our pieces. Uh, and we had never tried this process, which is a really fragile sort of, um, each of these could very easily break off if you flick it. And so to make such a large piece was a real challenge. And um, it was so exciting for us to get to do it here. Uh, there's so much 
support and, uh, and knowledge, just with everybody who works here, the interns, uh, that anything we had a question about um, was answered immediately, and we were able to cross-pollinate between departments. Um, and I think that that is why we were able to produce such a, a crazy big piece. Yeah, this is our largest piece today, which we're super excited about. We have another one that's uh, firing in the kiln as we speak that's five feet tall. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, like, fingers crossed. It could be <laughs> exploding as we speak. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, um, yeah, that was, that was definitely the first thing that drew us in as we came to Anderson Ranch. And Nancy and Doug showed us the kilns, and we're like, oh, my God, this is crazy. I don't know if you guys have seen the kilns, but our kiln is like this. And we have, like, a 25-inch height limit. Um, and uh, uh, it's like, that's cool, um, but it's a lot cooler to be able to do a five-foot piece. Uh, uh, and then we also learned a lot about kilns here, uh, and we plan on building, uh, they have the famous V6 kiln in their kiln room, and we're going to build the V8, which we're really excited <laughs> about, uh, which is, uh, uh, it's going to be a little bit bigger and, and girthier, and we're going to do it with uh, people that we met here at the ranch, we're going to do it on our property in Joshua Tree, which we're pretty excited about. Um, so that's a definitely a very explicit way that the ranch is changing our practice. But I think the most important way is definitely the personal relationships that we've built with the people here. Um, I also think that when it comes to expressing and making work, really the product sure is cool, um, but the story behind that piece, the amount of people that went into making it, um, how many people at the ranch gave us the knowledge to create this, um, we couldn't have made this three months ago, um, and now it exists uh, uh, because of the community, because of the communication between people that have different experiences inside of the art world. So that's really what we took from it, is the story and the relationships, and, uh, and I think a continuing relationship that will have for a long time, which is really cool. And also we just to, to see here, the, um, I went, when I went to art school, like there is a, more, a slightly more competitive atmosphere, and here there's very little judgment on uh, what's being made. So basically everybody feels free to really express themselves, which I think is hugely important. Um, for me, actually, when I came here, I started to do printmaking with Liz, and I had never, ever tried it before. Uh, and I know that uh, it could cause you to freeze up, but I think that the support from Liz and then and also just uh, Asa and Kat, who were in the studio all the time, like it was just amazing. It felt like a little family. I was in such a foul mood too when I showed up here, and then <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I was just working. I was cutting ruby lists like day after day. It's There's just, photos of it. Here. Oh yeah, yeah, we like <coughs> yeah, we could put those up. Can we yeah. slip through them? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, and we have a print here. Oh yeah, so that. Simon made and donated to the ranch for our 50th anniversary. And it's, it's on the uh, pedestal over there. And if you're interested in purchasing one, uh, just stop at the desk on your way out. But it's gorgeous. So it, <coughs> we, we don't do a lot of flat works. We do mostly sculptural things. And I was so excited to um, just try that out here. The print studio is so beautiful. And the, all the machinery got me like just so excited. So getting to sit there, I would stay up till 6 in the morning alone in the studio and um, cut all of these little things out with an X-Acto blade, uh, and I was in heaven. So Do you want to go <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I, l I really like tedious work. Uh, so these, <laughs> this is really cool. Actually, Liz called me beforehand uh, when, um, when Anderson uh, approached me at first to talk about the print for, uh, for the 50th, and uh, she had really liked this drawing I did on my iPad, and she herself cut uh, that design out with Ruby Lith and was explaining the process to me as kind of a fruit roll-up. Uh, you, have you ever seen the fruit roll-ups that have shapes cut out of them and you can peel them off? That's basically what's happening here is you cut the shape out and then peel it off, so it was, it was wonderful. Um, these are some of the prints that we made. She and I stayed up so late with Kat and uh, printed hundreds of these pieces in yeah. different colors. We should maybe tell people who Liz is. Oh, I'm sorry, Liz, Liz? Is, the, is the director of painting and, and printing here? Yeah, right? printmaking, uh, Liz and print making. And she is a, a, an amazing printer. Um, and uh, yeah, she was my printing and emotional support for the whole thing, which was just wonderful. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Let's see, those are some more. 
And here's back to yeah. the accretions. So these are some early tests that we were doing with um, paper clay because we'd never used paper clay before, which is which is really like a really fun thing to learn here because it's like a, it's much stronger. It's a lot easier to adhere at different stages of drying. Um, so that really opened up this piece. Uh, here is this piece in process. Um, some process photos of it. There it is, raw still. Um, this is us placing these like udders on the uh, on the five foot piece that's in the kiln right now. Uh, this is this piece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So underneath all of that fur, it's smiling, which is cool. So th this yeah. is a cool. If you stay on here for one second, yeah, just yeah. so that no, um, in case anyone doesn't know how this is made, we start by scoring a, um, a piece that we've thrown or coil built. Um, actually, our our uh, Henry, who's our ceramist, uh, will coil build or throw all of it, and then um, uh, and then another, another one of our ceramists, Rowan, is a master at this technique, and it is basically just brushing thousands and thousands of layers of wet clay onto the vessel until it starts to grow this fur. Uh, so it's a very natural process. The bigger it gets, the more you start to see how gravity can affect it. You see it, these sort of petals drooping more at the bottom. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's amazing to see the pre and post and how this shape really does actually sort of grow after it's been made. This photo kind of says a lot too about um, our studio and the way it works. Uh, and that like, that's Henry's cap. He's our lead ceramicist uh, on the piece. And, uh, and like, you can just feel Rowan's presence there too. Um, the two of them are so much a part of um, our ceramic work and just our studio vibe in general. Uh, it's really fun for us to have developed into a studio where initially, um, like, uh, Simon and I were, I suppose, like, the face and the creative power behind the company. Um, but at this point, um, it's absolutely a group effort of 10 to 12 people. I like to think of us as, like, the star players on a sports team or something like that. That's the best analogy I can think of. Um, but, like, everybody does their part um, creatively. Uh, as well as uh, in terms of practical application. It's, it's not just like a fabrication studio. It's, um, it's a place where all of us get together, share ideas. It's not like one of us comes down and whatever we say is like the concrete word. Um, everything is a discussion and it's like super, super fun and super cool to, to, uh, to have a studio like that because everybody benefits, which is rad. Um, and maybe- I, I think it shows in the work. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> the work has a yeah. great feeling, a great spirit sense of humor. Yeah. And, I mean, you guys let us bring them here too, which I don't know if yeah. that happens so often. We crashed the ranch with so many people. But there were five was, of us. Yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. Uh, yeah. Really an amazing experience for them too. To, to Some of them hadn't gone to art school and so I think this was uh, really invaluable for them uh, to all of a sudden be in a community where uh, everybody's doing something that they're also doing. Um, and I, I think that was wonderful. So that's had a big impact on our studio too. It's yeah. just their... their um, their drive after seeing what what you can do. Really, my, my largest motivation was so that th for us coming here was for them to have an experience that 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 they wouldn't have been able to afford otherwise. You know, which was super it. cool. It was it was amazing. You know, like as kids, they didn't exactly what you said. They didn't get to go to school, but they came here. They understood the environment. What like like a legitimate art community feels like um, in a place where you can express yourself in any way you feel. Uh, it was just, it was a super good experience for that. Yeah. Uh, going from that, too, we brought Belly with us, uh, who's a really cool uh, guy in our studio, too, and, and he and I carved this work together. Um, There's a piece here on the corner of the stage. Oh, yeah, here's, this yeah, is yeah. an un unfinished yeah. version. So. And what do you call this piece? The, oh, four-foot table. You came up with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, that is so yeah. good. Uh, it's actually six feet long, but it's the four-foot table. That's four feet uh, on If you get it. <laughs> uh, and six-foot bench, too. But so this is me working on it. I don't know if we have a photo of Belly with me on it, but... And then this is what it looks like finished, uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So it, it was fun to, to carve these. So this is, like, still a rough piece. That's what it looks like right after we carved it. Um, but I mean, the studio here is just insane that Sam Maloof built. It's crazy. So here's like individuals. That one's called Dorothy because it's clicking its heels, I guess. Uh, and then, I don't know, some other detail shots. This is like what these, we have four of these back in our studio. That This is what these look like eventually. Here's some like maple side tables. Um, what's cool is like, I, I taught Billy how to carve. He hadn't carved before. and. Um, and I carved two of these and he carved one. And uh, 
I would defy anybody to tell me who carved which, which is really cool because we've, we've just become so symbiotic in the way that we work together yeah. that um, we completely understand uh, the way we work, which is, it's just a good example of that. It's fun. Yeah. So. And you're going to come back and teach. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. Next summer, come take a, car, a wood carving class. Yeah. I'm going to bring my dad, too, because he's, he's uh, our dad taught us how to carve. Uh, he carves these, you'll see, I think we have photos later of these, like, uh, furry creatures mm -hmm. with um, little ebony horns. He carves all our ebony horns for us, which is really fun. Yeah. yeah well, let's cool talk about growing up with twins. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so what was, what was growing up together like? And did you work together on things, or? We did. We always, like, uh, we would um, sort of. I mean, I th we, uh, recently this story came up. This is such a bad story, actually, but I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> but, uh, there was a guy who had been picking on me, and uh, Nikki gave me a confetti egg, and he's like, okay, throw the confetti egg at him, and I'm going to go get him. And then so, like, and I did. And then well, I knew it would start a fight. <laughs> yeah. But uh. that's a really bad example. But <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to, what I, what I mean is that we were always sort of, like, playing these little roles and switching off and kind of really just coming, whatever came, to it, came at us, we would uh, both attack it from a different side. And so I think that really appro uh, really informed the way that we um, kept working together. Yes. And I, in fact, our uh, I think that we developed to have opposite talents because yeah. of that. Uh, and uh, it's really served us well in the end because we get to bring them back together and uh, uh, have a real conversation all the time because we're, we always have very opposite kinds of viewpoints. I remember leaving high school uh, and moving to New York, and Simon moved to Providence. And uh, um, cell phones, like I'd just gotten a cell phone. I was 18. I think that existed for four or five years or something. But um, uh, I remember having to like call people to try to get a job. Um, and I, I had like such insane anxiety, or to even just call friends. I couldn't use the phone for like a week. And I would leave the most ridiculous messages like, uh, hi, hey, uh, it's, um, uh, call me back, like just didn't make any sense. And I realized Simon always made the phone calls like when we were hanging out <laughs> in high school. So it just wasn't like a thing. It, I never had to deal with it on my own before. <laughs> And I was kind of like, he drove, yeah. so I didn't get my license till 21. He was yeah. like, I, I would sit in the back yeah. seat and turn the seat heater on, yeah. and he had to sit in the front. I was like, right. literally in the, I was getting chauffeured to, to high school. Uh -huh. well, there was a better, there was a better foot heater in the back seat, uh -huh. so he could sit in the back when it was cold, and I would drive, and people would make fun of us, be like, what are you driving? He's in the back seat, like telling you where to go. But then I had to drive and figure yeah. that out, and it was equally as hard as him figuring out how to do phone calls. So yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah totally. Well, let's funny. talk a minute about social consciousness in your work, yeah. because I know that's really important to both of you. It yes. is. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, it's been a focus for us for a long time, but it's only gotten more and more intense. Uh, I think it is a really tricky and difficult journey to go on, because um, as, you're, you know, as we're working, we have business interests, we have interests in each other, we have interests in social consciousness, but then we're also in environments like Aspen, for example, where um, your general experience is very, very privileged. And I think that we experienced in traveling to places like Cape Town, and then also coming and fitting in perfectly in places like this. Sorry, I got like nervous about it. <laughs> fitting in in places like this is, uh, is that it has exposed a whole lot of things um, internally, basically, that are really hard to figure out and hard to see. So a lot of our work has been focused on uh, us figuring it out, and I think we put sort of public displays of that figuring out. I wouldn't say we have figured anything out, and we wouldn't present like a, f a final, um, we wouldn't say we know what, what's right, you know? But we did try uh, very hard, particularly with this project. Uh, we went to South Africa. Yeah. Uh, this is a set of beaded work. These beads are very, very, very small, and those, um, those mushrooms are about eight feet tall. So this collection took two years uh, of a group of women. It started with 15 women, and it grew to nearly 200 being involved uh, in making these pieces, but it took an entire two years. I um, think you'd like, just tell the way this even started, like just experientially, like we had this sort of crazy um, ride where all of a sudden we were in uh, New York, we had our first solo show, it sold out in like two days. We were staying in a friend's, uh, uh, like in a friend's apartment, like a penthouse on the Hudson, 
and like taking ecstasy and dancing this whole music at night. I told this story yesterday too, but it was just kind of like, it's a really good way to sort of create this juxtaposition where, where we were, I think, high on our own supply for sure and feeling really like excited about stuff, which I think we deserve to. It felt, it was fun and we'd worked really hard to get there. And it's hard, hard not to enjoy it if it's of coming course. to you. Of course, well you should, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there, a lot of it was deserved, a lot of it was absolutely privileged and sort of just come to us because of a lot of our situation and, and luck and a lot of stuff uh, worked into it. But literally the next day after our show, we were on a plane to South Africa. So it was like getting on a plane to South Africa, um, hung over with like 24 hour flight and then we showed up and then it's like, we, we'd been to, to Cape Town before, but you drive, first thing, you, you get to the airport and then you drive through the, uh, through, through Kailiche, which is like the biggest township. And they don't even know how many people are there. There's no way to actually take a census, but it's... I think it's 80% of, of yeah, Cape Town lives like in townships, which are, or or are like the favelas in Brazil, basically. Right. So, um, so we were going through and then, and then right into literally working with these women and then going and visiting them in their, uh, we'd, we'd written some emails back and forth about how we wanted to do a project together. Um, and then like the next day we were like visiting their homes because we're sort of like, if we're going to start this project, kind of like we did here too, it's like you don't actually, it's not like you have this all drawn out plan of like, this is what we're going to make. If you're going to work with people, you have to integrate into a community. Mm -hmm. So we're like, let's see where they live and how they live and what's important to them and what they want to get across, what their motivations are in making work. And it's like you go into their homes and it's smaller than this black stage and it's like tin and like sand floor and you just go, dang, man, this is crazy. I mean, and uh, we have, I, like, I, I remember having just, literally I was like, oh, that flight was like, you know, I was just complaining about the flight. And then we wind up in this, in, in a, sh in a uh, shanty, you know, and, and, and then I immediately had this, uh, it was the beginning of two years of, of uh, white remorse, I think, that uh, I had to really work through. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I actually journaled all of that, if you ever want to see it in our book, so you can see what my thought process was. Um, but what Nikki is saying is that basically we just, we had no idea what we were getting into. And um, we took it as it came, and we kept seeing different issues coming up, different uh, social issues revolving around us working in Cape Town, especially as a white person working in Cape Town. There's a lot of things that are, there's more privileges that are given to you, and, it, uh, and that is shocking too. You see, uh, you see far more privileges given to you, uh, and it feels really unfair. So I think that we, as we started to get much more successful, our, our success was really quick and uh, we kind of skyrocketed. I think that the social consciousness part of it just filters in naturally because there is an element of success that can really destroy people. And I think that uh, we have tried as hard as possible to be self-aware and catch those moments and try to um, uh, divert that energy into something positive. So I think this was a big learning experience for us too to understand like what is actually good and what can support a community. Um, so meaning like uh, you, you go into, the, into a house that's a shanty like that and you just want to be like, hey, oh, here's 1500 bucks or something like just go, you know, I don't know, fix your situation. And it's like the reality is just handing somebody money, um, it's, it's just unsustainable. Um, so what we did with this project was created what I like to call, this was not philanthropic, it was a community support. Um, so we offered a market that, that, that these women could never achieve because their social situation is just, w basically wouldn't allow it. It has nothing to do with their talent. Um, it's just their reality. Well, we were, it was handed to us, basically. Right. So we, we wanted to give it to them. Because we're white American men. Twin males. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, so for us, it was great to be like, hey, we have this privilege. Why don't you take a piece of that? And so um, mainly our lead designers, there were like 40 or so women working on this project, um, but our lead 15 that we really, uh, th that were part of the design process of the project um, uh, left with, um, at the end of this project, you know, probably uh, 40 times what they'll make in a year, in, in two years. Mm -hmm. So they but can start mm -hmm. their own businesses, they and can yeah, do their exactly. own thing. And besides the money, actually more important more than important, that is yeah. the empowerment because um, these pieces, just like I was talking about with our, with uh, my sculpting assistant Belly, um, uh, like you, there's no way you could tell what we express and what they express, and we we won't tell anybody because there's no point. And and the point is to say that these women are as capable as we are, 
is making fantastic work. And I think many people consider this our most important body of work, and it's because we didn't do it alone. We did it with, um, with people that had um, never been taught to, to make art. They'd only been taught to make you know, tourist trinkets, um, and they'd never been allowed to express because they didn't have the luxury of, uh, of, of, the, um, of, the, of the supplies or the money to even experiment. That's so, true, actually. That, yeah. that uh, what we learned, a big thing that we learned was that it is a luxury to get to express yourself the way that we get to express Absolutely. ourselves. Absolutely. Well, and think about just beads. Especially for it to like be your um, source of income is uh, is a huge luxury. So big time. Uh, it was that was it was just uh, all around wonderful. I mean, after experiencing that, I don't think we could go uh, yeah. back to doing something that is uh, not that way. Oh, this is kind of an interesting piece more. too. Yeah, there was since you're talking about the luxury and the luxury yeah, exactly. The There's a, a a good set of the women. I I think I said that we started with 15, and then um uh, and then it grew to in, to involve uh, more than 200 women. Yeah. Um, the the growing involvement uh, actually came with these this large mound here there were several of them but um, there's a, a good portion of, of the women that we were working with are uh, immobile basically because of illness and so we designed this one um, to be tiled so that all of these circular pieces could be made on their own and then just attached in studio later on so uh, they could our core team was able to travel but there are so many that weren't uh, and so it was really important for us to to not just Again, allow uh, the the more privileged uh, of the people we were working with to be the only ones getting to work on it. I think is really important. Yes, yeah. and and I have to admit they taught me how to bead. Okay. Oh yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's <laughs> right. Cool. You came to the workshop and oh, so maybe that's a good way to talk about the pinnacle of this of uh, or like I guess the yeah I guess you could call it like the the sort of the end of the story, it's still going now, we're keeping the support going, but we got to show all this work at the Cooper Hewitt uh, uh, Design Museum in, uh, in New York, which was amazing. Yeah. And uh, uh, we brought um, four of the women uh, over to uh, New York uh, to, to share that experience with us because they were, they were part of the team and they, they were part of the expression and the work. And they've and been the most involved, and also that we're, we're, it was, we wanted to bring everybody, but obviously, uh, I mean, yeah. it just couldn't happen. Well, uh, also, like visas were very difficult. None but, of them had um, passports. Some of them were too sick to travel. It was actually difficult to pick who got to come. But but the coolest part of it was that I mean, um, so you're a black woman in in in, uh, in Kailicha. Um, if uh, one of them was was a lesbian, if she'd come out, they would have killed her. Um, like they would have put a tire over her head. And well, uh, maybe. I maybe. Mean, yeah. It's hard to say. It has happened. It's a very difficult place. Uh, they live in an insane reality where, I mean, they're just not taken seriously uh, because of who they are. And, in uh, that environment. In that yeah. environment. So what was great is we were talking early on and they were aware of Beyonce. And Beyonce is like, come on, she's amazing. She's like, you know, the epitome of like a empowered black woman that's just kicking ass all over the world. And, um, and so we were able through friends to get Beyonce to come and meet the women at the show. Uh, and it was, it was like wild. amazing. Uh, and it was like, like... I think that photo was the most, I've, like, especially, um, I mean, my friend Angamso, for sure, I'm texting her all the time, and she's, she was one of them who came. And she's like, that picture is the whole reason I did any of it, and it's just really cool. It was awesome to tie it up that way. Oh, we should, oh I don't think God, we do. I should not think about that. No. no. But the coolest thing is that, uh, <laughs> I think it's on our Instagram somewhere, I don't know. It's yeah. on her Facebook. But, her um, name is Nangamso and <laughs> uh, Good luck <laughs> spelling that. Ask Simon later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it was really cool because for me, it was really awesome to watch them understand that they deserve to be meeting Beyonce. It wasn't like, oh, so nice to meet you, and it wasn't like that. It was like empowered and like, yeah, we made this stuff, how is it? And they showed Beyonce a dance, and then Beyonce later on took their face paint and put it in a video that she'd done like six months later, and they all knew that it'd come from that. So it was just like this thing where they're like, wow, we're getting to touch pop culture, and we came from a place where it's like, I can't even get, you know, uh, my community in the city bowl to even pay attention to anything I want to say, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they're on, you know, the Smithsonian Design Museum, National Stage in New York, and talking to Beyonce and having her, uh, you know, basically pinch their style for a video. It was amazing. <laughs> well, she yeah. asked how to yeah. do it. Of course, she asked. Yeah, she asked how yeah. to do it, and, then, yeah. and there's a. Uh, yeah, the <laughs> they influenced her. It was cool. Oh, it was yeah. really right. It's calamine lotion, but it's a. There's a, a specific face paint that's. Uh, it's like a really beautiful pink, from a. It's a, a mud from a place called Hogsback, 
Um, and they replaced it with calamine in New York. And she asked <laughs> how to do it, and they said calamine. And she was like, oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> it was like it's cool. just it's wild. <laughs> um, but maybe I'll just kind of flip through yeah. like some more of these pieces. Here's like a little, yeah. that's a toy. This is like another one of those mushrooms in like a chair, which is cool. Uh, these are more of the, so the one on the right, um, uh, the women made the stripes um, off site. So it was another one of those pieces that people could, that, that they could work on, not, uh, you know, just at home. Uh, these, this is a close up of those tiles. Uh, so these pieces, like, the one on the right's like five feet tall. That's like eight or seven and a half feet. Uh, this one's like eight feet tall, the yellow and red one, just to give you reference. And also uh, things like, uh, for, I just want to say, like, the, the, um, these textures. Oh, I, don't, I lost the picture. picture. There it was. Like the beard on the right side, and then there's also sort of fringy on this one on the left. Takes so, so much longer than doing the flat beading. Um, and that was one of the things, I just uh, w forgot a portion of this project, is that um, our team was actually salaried, where they're usually paid piece by piece. Uh, and if you're getting paid piece by piece, it makes zero sense to put all this fringe onto something. So uh, it allowed a lot of experimentation with texture. Um, and I th that was a very big part of it as well. Let's move on to... Uh, this guy? That's a piece from our first solo show. The idea is it was called the Beast Feast. Uh, <laughs> so like hanging out around a, a table and having it, I guess it's like the feast, you know? Uh, this is like a- It was about decadence. Yeah. I mean, this yeah, is before decadence. we went to Cape Town, so yeah. I think you can actually see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, then this is just a close up of one of those, one of those pieces. Uh, this is another one of our bees, so it's like cast bronze and fur and uh, close up of a foot. Uh, this is a texture Simon developed that's based on a ball sack. <laughs> I was trying to, yeah. I'm a, I love to do, um, I, I'm a materials tester basically is most of what I do. Uh, for example, this texture is one of the things that I came up with and um, I tend to do research and development and then I kind of hand it off to the team that is the Haas Brothers. I'm like this, uh, I, I'm this little, I'm a seed guy basically. But this was one of my seeds, which was uh, I was trying to recreate testicles. I wanted to make a hammock that was uh, that looked like them. Um, but I I wound up just I took a balloon that I blew up and I laminated leather onto it and popped it, spray painted it, and traced it. Uh, and then I stretched swimwear fabric over a big these stretcher bars uh, and then um, traced the same wrinkle pattern onto it put a layer of leather over that, and then two people pass a needle back and forth through this uh, big frame. And then you cut the thing off and it goes like that. So this, so this couch, just the leather, took six people six months to produce just the leather. And it's, it's really outrageous. comfortable. We haven't done, we yeah. don't really do them very much yeah. because it's too much work, but. <laughs> it's like sitting on a ball sack. It's, it's cool. very, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Which don't we all love that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 this is a, these are, the gold pieces are a process that Simon created early in our career that's sort of become like a signature of our studio that's like this, uh, we call it hextile, and it's basically brass mosaic. So they look as if they're poured, but if you look closely, you can see texture, little hexagonal, let me see if I have a detail, here we yeah. go. Yeah. So you can see that these are actually each hand placed, hammered, and then uh, carved, ground down, sanded and then polished. This uh, came from, uh, I had been seeing um, CAD renderings of hexagonal surfaces. And when you see a, if you do a hexagonal surface like that in a computer and then bend it, they get really, really, really warped. Uh, each hexagon does. And I was so obsessed with keeping the hexagons not warped that um, I thought to start with one piece and then just grow, expand out from there and shave them slowly as you, uh, as you grow. Uh, and so it takes a very long time to do it, but it does wind up looking like that and you almost forget that there's a grid at all, uh, which is really cool. We like to work that hard on something and then have it hardly be noticeable. Uh, just, I think it puts lots of energy into the piece. Let's take some questions for well, sure. Let's, yeah. let's, let's see the next up. one. We'll, yeah. we'll take some well, questions. We'll take photos. Yeah. <laughs> More of the ceramics? Yeah, man, go That's through awesome a couple. Photo. This is really good one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's put that one. Oh, oh, wow. One more thing I want to show. This is a glaze that Simon created um, where oh, you yeah. can see these are the same pieces. And they're just in different light. 
so these, this is in, uh, in uh, just regular, uh, uh, like, uh, halogen or in, uh, incandescent light. And this is uh, under uh, fluorescent. Uh, so so uh, they actually turn completely pink uh, under fluorescent light. And we have different variations of that. This one we you can see like a half and half where it's pink on one side and white on the other. We call uh, this tangium because we saw Avatar and there was, I think there was an element that was called unobtainium in it. Yeah. And so we started to call that hard to get -ium. Uh, and then, <laughs> and then this, one cha this one changes, so we just thought we give, would give it that name. All of our pieces <laughs> are jokey names, you know? So. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's take some questions. Yeah, totally. Okay, so hold on, we'll bring you a microphone. Hi. Um, I've never heard of you before. Um, That's cool. <laughs> and, um, do you just show this stuff, or is it for sale? I mean, do you sell it? We do sell yeah. it, yeah. You do yeah. sell it. We have a gallery in New York, uh, and we also go, we do the, the fair circuit, um, like Basel and um, mm. uh, Chicago, Expo yeah. Chicago. We, we make a lot of, uh, we usually make our collections just in-house. If we're feeling like making something, we'll just do it. Um, we, we do some commission work, but I'd say like 95% of our production is just We'll have an idea come out of our head and we'll just do it. And then yeah. does, um, do you send part of the profit back to Africa? Oh, absolutely. For the, oh, for for the those beaded pieces, pieces yeah. yeah, that was built into the project. Yeah. Uh, it was a, a big portion of it. So some of them go back to the organization Monkey Biz. Right. Uh, and then a lot of it went to uh, increasing salaries. Well, so it's like also I, I just want to like sort of I'm not correcting your language. I'm just saying we didn't like send it back. It was we were just paying them for the work that they did. But it was we basically were just paying them what they deserved instead of what we could have paid them. If that makes sense. But I mean, sense. if they sold and you made a bunch of money, we paid them regardless. But yeah. if they sold, then yeah, they made more money. They got more money. It's kind of so like we pay ourselves a salary to work in our own studio, and if we sell a piece, and then you it's get like a commission exactly afterwards. So right. it was it, uh, to be clear, it was a for-profit project, and they were all employed. It was not like it was it not a charitable charity. project. Right. We just tried to fit as much, um, we tried to change practices as much as possible uh, when it comes to dealing with, uh, with a, that sort of a business relationship, which was very difficult for us. Uh, but we, we made it as ethical as, as, as possible for, for us, somebody with our experience. It actually changed our, our process at home, too. It really did. Yeah, yeah, like we pay our employees really well. We give them a lot more free reign in the way that they choose to express themselves on the work. We also and started to list them all on our website because right. that was part of our project in, in Cape Town was to, to give credit to everybody who worked on it. And then we realized, oh, we're not necessarily doing that back home. So it should be, it should really be the, the way we just operate in general. And I just think that's the, f the future, yeah. honestly. Like, you know, I, I'm, I'm not blaming anybody that doesn't work that way because to each their own. But, but I think like the way that we work is just there's so much benefit to giving the people around you credit that they deserve um, for everybody involved, us included. I mean, they express so much better on the work than they did before because they're really proud about everything that they make. Um, and if, uh, you know, we're flying them all out to our next uh, show in New York uh, because they're the artists as, as much as we are. Um, I don't awesome. want to hog the <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, no. I do have one more question. Sure. I, are you doing something tonight? Are you part of the REM? Thing, uh, or are you different people? I love that band. Like the band, or? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no. I, don't know no. I don't think we are. That was our first concert, R.E.M. <laughs> it was. Yeah. That's great. That's great. It was actually really fun. Our, our <laughs> brother knew Michael Stipe, so he was like took us backstage. It was super fun. Yeah. Good. So yeah. these smaller vases, the, the painting that goes on of the little petals, mm -hmm. about how long does your guy spend on one vase? So Roan, on this piece, I, just because it's here and you can see the size of it, this took her, oh man, hundreds of hours probably. Wow. Crazy. So I, I yeah. think for these, these ones are this big and they take about two days of, it's not constant brushing. You have, it's almost like incubating an egg where you have to keep moving it to places and checking on it and then brushing it. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's not full-on activity the entire time, but it's two full days for something like this size. You let it dry, you get back to it. It's a whole process. Yeah. This was different here, though, wasn't it? Because yeah. it dries so quickly. Yeah, the yeah. environment made it completely made it different. faster. So actually, she was able to work on it pretty much nonstop. But she uh, still she like did much some all nighters, as I because recall. It is, uh, <laughs> God, if, what is that? I forgot what it's called. But when people see on conveyor belts something going too many times, they start to go crazy. 
I feel like the, anything I could, uh, all these processes I invent are torturous for, yeah. for the people. <laughs> <laughs> or they have to deal with, like Roan was already a little crazy. So she was oh, gonna, in, in, in a good way. way. Yeah, totally. That's what I mean. She killed it. <laughs> yeah. Good. Kayla. Hi. Um, you guys have talked a lot about um, this various themes in this talk about um, civil discourse and um, so forth, but one thing we haven't talked much about is sexuality and shame, which I see as a thread running through a lot of your work. Yes, That's true. Talk and about that, please. Thanks for mentioning that, because actually it is where we started our social consciousness um, push, really. Um, our earliest breakout piece was called The Sex Room. Actually, it's called Advocates for the Sexual Outsider, but we refer to it as The Sex Room, and it was shown at Basel, um, and it was a bunch of different sex toys, and um, also, uh, sort of sexual theme. Oh, the photos of it? I ha yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, oh, just this. But. These are paintings. So this actually, we got a little bit in trouble because these aren't design objects, but the frames were, so we were able to put them in uh, at Basel. But the idea was we created a small environment where someone could go in on their own and sort of experience all these toys and odd, uh, really odd, um, an odd sexual experience that we created for them. Uh, it was not in your face, it wasn't an aggressive kind of sexuality, it was more just saying like, look, this is here and why don't we experience it? And the idea was, uh, everybody who left the room was smiling or laughing. Uh, and uh, some people would walk by and shake their heads and, uh, and that's okay too. Um, but the, the biggest thing was to was that everybody who came out wanted to talk about it afterwards, and so we wound up having sex conversations with total strangers from everywhere, and uh, it, <coughs> it made us realize that shame is kind of the common thread that um, runs through sexuality, and I think that extends to a lot of other areas too, not just sexuality, but for us it was easy to focus on, uh, particularly for me growing up gay, I had pretty good uh, understanding of, of how that operates. Um, so uh, it's been a big part of it for us too. You know, actually in Cape Town, one of the women that we worked with, Nangamsa, who I mentioned before, uh, is also gay. And she, um, she gave me even more insight to just how, uh, how much shame plays a part in her reality because of it. Uh, so, um, I think if we could do away with shame in general, people would feel free to be a lot more creative and produce beautiful works. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm super impressed. It's just amazing what you've done. It's just incredible. Oh, thanks. Um, and you've obviously become, as you said, become famous very, very quickly. And, and you mentioned earlier on about how you didn't want to let this kind of go to your head. And I think that's amazing, especially in this kind of celebrity culture. And I just was interested to know a bit more about that practice for you and, and how you've done that so far and how you see that being part of your practice in the future. Um, you know, for at first I thought that I was doing it and I wasn't doing it. Uh, I had a friend of mine who kept telling me to, he was like, don't believe all the stuff that you read about yourself in a magazine. And what's What's crazy is that you start to, um, you know, everybody approaches you with a, a preconception of who you are, uh, at least in, an, in, a, in a design environment or uh, at Art Basel. Uh, and then you read things about yourself uh, and it does just change the way you think. So um, in terms of how, how to do that, I'm not really sure, ex unless you wanna go uh, extricate yourself from your current situation and do something completely different, uh, and I mean completely different, like going to Cape Town for us love, uh, and also not to seek out the same kind of comforts when you're trying to experience those things. Uh, I think it, it's hard, as it's one of the hardest thing to, to notice these, uh, these types of issues because you're just conditioned to experience that, and, and also, you know, success has its own conditioning that comes with it. Uh, there's things you're supposed to talk about, ways to compose yourself on stage, for example. And so um, uh, as long as you can remember that just each time it happens, like this isn't what my experience was before I started doing this, I think it's really important. And then also to think, what about my experience before I started to uh, notice this? Was I doing wrong back then, basically? What wasn't I looking at myself? Uh, how wasn't I looking at myself when I was a child, basically? It's a hard thing to answer. 
I mean, for me, I just try to keep this like personal view. Well, for instance, I think there's very, you know, whatever somebody would consider success, there's very successful artists that are shit artists. And there's very amazing artists that never get the time of day from anybody. And I know plenty on both sides. And um, I think you need to understand that, uh, like, I know how hard we work to make our, make our work and how much thought we put into it. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's good art. And I'm sure there's people in this room that thinks it sucks, which is cool. That's great. And what you start to understand is that, that the way that people perceive your work, either it catches fire and it doesn't. And honestly, it's not really in your control. You can do what you can to kind of push it. But the, whatever some would say, if we're famous or successful, whatever any of that shit means, it's like the reality is there's much more talented people out there. Um, like the women we worked with in Africa, for instance, and they don't, no one gives them the time of day. So I think we just need to like, you just, I just constantly remind myself how lucky I am because mm. I don't do anything I don't want to do pretty much ever. And it's like, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> and it didn't used to be like that. And it's like pretty fucking privileged to be in that position. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want to do it. And it's like, that's insane. You know, I also remember that I'm not necessarily happier now than when I was bussing tables in New York and I had no money and nothing. Like, you just need to keep stuff in perspective. This doesn't make you happy. I love doing it. That's not what I'm saying. It's like I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world because I love this so much. And I love getting to support our family back in LA. I love getting to support our family in Africa. I love getting to engage with our family here in Aspen. But it's like, you just need to remember that there's you in this room that are 10 times as talented as us that just haven't gotten the shot. There's people that work here or there's students or there's uh, uh, interns that haven't gotten their shot and they may never get their shot. And that's just part of the sad reality of it. Or maybe it's not even sad, it's just how the world works. Um, so I don't take our success for granted. I know how lucky we are. And I think it's just like a frame of mind. Um, like, this came with hard work, but it also a lot of luck and a lot of privilege. So, I think it's just that. Question, please. How are, how are changes in technology affecting both your production process as well as your creative process? Um, changes in technology uh, have actually affected both. We don't use computers very often to start an idea, but um, an example would be that color changing glaze. Uh, Google has, or, and YouTube actually, have really affected us. Uh, the fact that I can search, um, I got interested in optics, and I just searched for two days about what goes into different optics and the physics of light. And I uh, found this one material that is used in calibrating lasers, and uh, uh, it happens to change colors under different lights. Um, and uh, that's a recent technology that I, I just sort of took took it and applied it to a craft instead of to a scientific application. Um, I would never have known about that if it weren't for the internet. And uh, it, it didn't really exist until five years ago either. Uh, but we don't, we don't involve computers heavily uh, other than that, that, other than more inspiration, I think. Yeah, there's uh, some like, well maybe even here I can show. Okay, so like these are, these are maquettes. Um, so I don't know which one. I think it's the little stool on the left. So I don't know if oh, you can yeah. tell, but these are like this big, like the, ta the little coffee tables like this. And then this is, this, is, this is what it looks like in stone when it's done. Mm -hmm. And so we used, I guess the way we used technology in this situation was, this was literally hand carved, but we took the little purple guy, scanned it, created a, like a CNC foam model of it, and then carved the stone off of the foam model. So that's a way we, we've used it. We, we like to use it too if you yeah. can minimize shipping. It's to ship stone around is um, difficult. Uh, it's difficult and it's not very good for the environment. Uh, it costs a lot of money. So if you can just scan something and send the drawing to a different place and then they blow it up uh, there, it's so pretty this is, wonderful. This, is, thing. this is the bottom of a beast that we made, a little toy, and we, we, uh, we laser cut the plate that goes on the bottom. That's the use of technology, I suppose. But then but it's hand stamped and polished. I mean, we're really, cr like, um, we grew up as craftspeople. Our dad yeah. was a stone carver, and um, so we were carving stone at 14, and I think that that's how we relate to, uh, to materials and objects. 
uh, really the, the, um, the computing part is interesting to us, I think, as, as again, like inspiration and, and where you can add efficiency without removing some hand, I think, is, import is, a, is yeah. what we like to do. And I actually think of technologies affecting our work not as a tool necessarily, but socially. So meaning like the fact that the women in South Africa were aware of Beyonce, that couldn't have happened 20 years mm -hmm. ago, you know? And it's like that they have smartphones and that they can perceive that. Or, you know, like we're sort of doing everything we can to sort of try to change the culture there in our time and of the lives of individuals. But the reality is with the internet, with younger generations, it's almost just gonna flush itself out. I mean, you need people that are speaking well and like things that can change the world in a good way. But technology is like taking us all for this ride that I think, I think like, you know, you can't really push somebody down because of their color or their sexuality because it's, the internet exists. And you can go on and you can find your community, whoever you are. And, uh, and I think that it's affected our, our practice a lot because um, because of this sort of like cloud source reality, mm -hmm. the way people think is more mm -hmm. as a group. Uh, mm -hmm. So, anyways, am I wrong? wrong Not at all. Yeah, no, okay, right. no, no. I mean, I just think about my mindset in the '90s and then mm -hmm. now, and um, uh, all of the things going back to maybe being aware of yourself uh, as you start to get successful. You're getting so much more feedback online, and yeah. like I've started to get vocal about my opinions actually almost in order to get checked on them uh, because getting checked by your community is, is uh, a great thing to invite. I think everybody should try doing it. Uh, but I, I, I just say whatever is on my mind and then I get checked and that's and um, what my peers are saying to me ends up filtering into our work because uh, it's, uh, it's always on my mind. So. By the way, I was sort of like on that note, I was daring people that worked here to ask us the most like difficult question to answer. One of them was even joking, this guy Emerson, I don't know if he's in here or if he's in the, in the cafeteria, but he was like joking that he was gonna say like, hey dude, can you fart on stage? Oh my you know, God. Like, <laughs> which <laughs> obviously didn't happen, but we love, we, <laughs> we love getting like put on the spot. It's super fun, so anyways. Yeah. I can't <laughs> to answer that question. I can't either. <laughs> well, the running joke was like, because of the low atmospheric pressure in Aspen, like while we were working here, like I was just like farting all the time. <laughs> and it was crazy. And then we would always go, like we went to yoga all the time. We were calling it broga because it was like uh, me and, and two of the uh, belly and, and Henry, the guys that were working with us, we would go. And then the, the goal was always to like try to fart during Shavasana. Oh my God. And, uh, and none of us could ever do it because we got stage fright. So. <laughs> But the idea was that Emerson knew about this story and he was going to try to force me in the ultimate situation to do it. But anyways. <laughs> so, anyways, I'm sorry. Now you know why we love them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Okay. All right. Why don't we take one more question? Then I know that we have students here who might want to go back to their workshops, and please feel free to do that. Uh, and that would be fine. And... Uh, Otherwise, we could take a, a couple more questions. Yeah. All right, well, <clears throat> it seems like you've accomplished a lot of your visions, and so I'm sure you have more percolating. What is maybe one of your next big dreams to accomplish? Uh, do you want to go? Or I guess, yeah. yeah. I, well, um, I, I personally, I've started to draw a lot more. I've, I studied painting um, in college, and I'm going back to, uh, to trying to see the world that way um, instead of through forms. And uh, I think that our work is going to change for sure as a result of that. Um, one, of, one of my personal biggest dreams is actually going to be happening in about a year and a half in Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, um, a sort of a spin-off of the bead project uh, where I, I made a another process with beads where it's sort of a mathematical, it's a logical way of building beaded objects and um, I can create these floral bead systems, emergent patterns. Uh, so that's actually what I'm the most fascinated by and uh, my dream is to present uh, my, uh, my interest in linguistics really through beads and that's what I will do there. And you won't know what that means until you see it. <laughs> uh. For me, um, we we raised 1.2 million dollars for nonprofit this year with uh, with our pieces at auction, and I just really want to do more of that, um, and on a bigger level, which I think is pretty pretty spectacular. I'm really proud of that because uh, we're six years into our studio, but only four into making art, you know. 
uh, like we were cabinet builders before that. So um, we've been giving a lot of those opportunities. And uh, I think of uh, the point of being an artist is to affect things socially. And if I think about affecting things socially, I think about the efficiency in affecting those things. And I think that giving money and uh, creating like social awareness projects is, is the biggest way we can make a difference. Because it's awesome to have a piece in someone's house. I, I love that. I love getting to affect people personally. I love getting to work on the pieces themselves. But I think that, uh, that giving money and time and uh, ability away to other people is, uh, is, is a lot more efficient because you can plant the seed that becomes much larger. So I want to do more of that. Yeah, go on. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Adam. Cool. So, Nikki and Simon, thank you thank so you. much. Of course, guys. Thank Love you. Love having so you as nice. part of yeah. our family. <laughs>